1968, a 24-year-old college graduate, Ray Holt, had the opportunity to be a part of the state-of-the-art computer project for the F-14A Tomcat fighter jet. After the completion of the project, he was told it had to be kept secret, and it was for 30 years. By the time he was allowed to go public with his accomplishment, Intel had already developed a foothold into microprocessor history with their own microprocessor. This is a story about the top secret F-14A Tomcat project and how Holt got involved in it. Ray Holt was born in 1944 and grew up in a Compton suburb of Los Angeles, California. At an early age, his neighbor showed him how radio technology worked by opening the cases, cleaning out the dust, and removing the tubes and cleaning and replacing them. At 12 years old, Holt was already on the road that would shape his future. While in high school, he was an underachiever struggling to barely maintain a B average and getting into a lot of trouble. After high school, Holt attended the local community college. He got a job through his friend's father at a waste dump disposal site. His first job was to stand in the garbage all day and water all the trash so it could be compacted by the heavy equipment. He was motivated to pursue a professional career by this experience. Holt attended the University of Idaho and studied forestry. Since he was not doing well in chemistry, the Dean of Forestry suggested he take a class in the physics of electricity. This class gave him a new motivation and eventually led him to a degree in electronic engineering from California Polytechnic State University in Panoma, California. During his last semester at California Polytechnic, the engineering college organized career interview days with companies interested in California Polytechnic students, and graduates were offered great jobs, especially in aerospace industry as it was the height of the Vietnam War. Holt ended up working for Garrett Air Research, which specialized in aircraft systems. His younger brother Bill also accepted a job with Garrett Air Research in the same year. They were assigned to work on the F-14 computer design. At least a year we worked together and he did a lot of the programming to help me test the chip ahead of time called simulators. And uh, really in our, for brothers it was the best time in our life because when we were younger we fought a lot just like normal siblings do. And, and But we really worked together, we were serious, we wanted to make sure it all worked and we wanted to do a good job. In 1971, one year after the computer was completed, Bill passed away from a brain tumor at the age of 24. I just have a lot of great memories about that year we worked together. Holt had to keep his work secret for 30 years. He was told this project was important to U.S. security and the details on how this plane was made must not be revealed. This airplane was designed to compete with the Russian Russian's latest airplane and in the 60s and 70s we were in what's called a Cold War. They were not actually fighting but we were just trying to be more powerful than each other and this plane was designed to be our most powerful plane at the time and we were using technology not only on on my computer and the computer but the wings and 
the missile systems, everything was really high tech. And they just didn't want the word to get out that we're even working on it. Finally, in 1998, the U.S. Navy allowed him to talk about his work publicly. When I realized in 1970 that I couldn't get a patent, then I knew I would get no financial compensation. And as a young engineer, I really didn't expect it because I didn't know how things work. But I knew I wouldn't get anything. So as the 10 years went on in 20 and 30, uh, my main interest became just letting the world know that, that this happened, that it was a fact of history and not just something secret to be hidden forever. And so that's why I was always pushing to get it published. Uh, when it was finally published, I did get a lot of negative reaction. Uh, things like, oh, Ray is just trying to change history. Uh, the books are already written on history, so he's trying to change it. Uh, he's trying to get attention to himself. Uh, one person said, well, Ray seems like a good designer. Why is he doing this? You know, as if I'm doing something uh, uh, deceitful. So there's a lot of interesting reaction like that. Uh, most of during the first year or two after I introduced it. But I think after they realized that I had the actual chips, it was in a real airplane that, that was flying in 1970. Uh, I had all my design documentation. Uh, so there was plenty of proof that, that it really happened. And so I haven't gotten a lot of negative reaction. In fact, hardly any in the last uh, 10 years. And a lot of it has been positive as I speak at universities because some of the professors at the universities are my age or younger. So they realized what was going on back then and they could see that this was a reality. And so I get real positive response from uh, universities right now. In September 2009, the Air and Space Smithsonian Magazine recognized his early microprocessor design as one of the top 10 Air and Space innovative designs of the 20th century. Even though this wasn't the first airplane to have movable wings, uh, it was the first airplane to have the wings moved completely by the computer. So they called it a fly-by-wire airplane which means it was flying by electronic wire or by the computer. The early airplane that had movable wings was called the F-111, and the pilot could move the wings, but he had to do it by a mechanical stick. And so he had to adjust the wings first and then take off. But on the F-14, the pilot just flew the plane and the wings just moved automatically based on how fast he was going or how high he was going. When the project was finished, I asked them if we could patent the chips or if we should patent the chips because I thought that'd be really nice as a young engineer to get a patent. And my company, Garrett, said, absolutely no. I said, well, are you sure? Can we ask the Navy? And so they did and they said no. So there was no compensation from patents. And But I did publish an article and I submitted the article to Computer Design Magazine. The magazine said, well, it's clearly a military project. You're going to have to get approval because we don't want to publish any secrets. And so I had to go back and ask to approve or publish the article. And they said, no, we can't say anything about it. And that was it. They just wouldn't even discuss it. The F-14, of course, brought a lot of the Air Force stability and bombing capabilities of attack aircraft to a much, much greater uh, range around the world by taking them aboard carriers and being able to launch much, much closer to the targets. Uh, being a uh, two crew member aircraft, it also allowed it a lot of capabilities for range reconnaissance, uh, electronic warfare, and with all of that, it uh, really helped the Navy and the United States reach farther and farther out. Uh, again, the swing wing design, the twin engine uh, capabilities really made the uh, F-14 very influential in the naval aviation heritage. I don't get any compensation today. Uh, 
When I was able to talk about it in 1998, I contacted a gentleman named Sam Ismail. And he was in charge, or he is in charge of the Vintage Computer Festival. And so he invited me to come and be the key speaker at one of the, one of the events that he had. And I got a lot of activity out of that, a Wall Street Journal article and some electronic business magazine articles. But there's no compensation from that. And I also speak at universities today, and I don't accept compensation from them because I'd like to talk to the students and let them know about this history. The Wall Street Journal contacted the festival owner, Sam Ismail, and so he arranged a meeting between myself and Ted Hoff, who was considered one of the principal designers of the first Intel microprocessor, which came out in 1972. And I took the documentation with me and the picture and the chips. And so for the first five minutes, asked me questions about it and how it worked. And then for the next 40 minutes, he proceeded to tell us how great his design was and why it changed the world, and et cetera. It was just more of a one-sided meeting, and he wasn't really all that interested in what we did, even though clearly it was before the design that he worked on. The only situation with Intel is that I remember their website said they were the uh, developers or designers of the first microprocessor, and so I sent their webmaster an email referring to my webpage, and I got no response back. But a few months later, they changed their website to say, developers of the first commercial microprocessor as if they were excluding military in their definition.